Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature, Journey to the Land of the Snow Leopard, Part 1. I'm your host, Kendall Bauer, and today we are joined by expedition leader Conan Dumanil. Conan, I'm so happy to be here with you today. I'm going to hand it off to you. Thank you, Kendall, and hello to our audience joining in today. Thanks, thanks for coming in. Uh, I'd like you to join me on this, this little virtual journey. A uh, very Jules Verne-esque uh, title we chose for the webinar today. But uh, with our season just about to start uh, in a few weeks actually from now, uh, with India, Nepal and Bhutan and most of Asia opening up for, for the winters, that's when our, our main, uh, what's the start of our main season as we call, uh, we can't just, we can't wait to talk to you about uh, this really uh, exciting, super adventurous, uh, fantabulous trip uh, of uh, the one that we do to go see the snow leopards in Ladakh. Uh, the only way I think to express uh, this trip is using superlatives and you will see just why as we take you through this journey. So uh, it is uh, a land of stunning uh, contrast, beauty uh, and also extreme uh, weather, and extreme contrast uh, to that uh, extent. And uh, it, but it, it can be a lot of fun as well. We've been uh, doing these trips for a little over two years now. Uh, we fixed upon a beautiful uh, little spot uh, up in the secluded uh, Himalayas that works for this beautiful adventure that we have. And uh, I've been privileged to be leading this trip right from the first season uh, when India opened up post COVID. Uh, this was one of the first trips that, that took off the ground. And uh, this land, uh, is is a magical place. Uh, it is nothing like you've ever seen anywhere before. And we go here not just for the stunning landscapes, but also to see one of the most elusive uh, cats in the world. Now, to this presentation, I am going to defer more on the side of logistics and what we do. I'm sure you have, a lot of you have joined us today, have probably read up the itinerary on the website. I've looked at pictures, I've seen past webinars, I've seen uh, photos and images of this fantastic adventure. And in your minds, you probably have the question of, you know, what is it going to be like on a day-to-day -day basis? What can we actually uh, expect that we don't see in the brochures? And that's exactly what I'm going to be running uh, with you here today. So let's start off with orienting ourselves a little bit as to where this place is. So Ladakh is in the extreme northern part of India. It is uh, on the tri-national uh, boundary of China, Pakistan, and India, but it is uh, a territory in India. It's part. Uh, it's a newly uh, constituted uh, union territory, uh, and it is completely mountainous. There is no, uh, or very, very hardly uh, any flat land at all in Ladakh, and the only flat land you see is also at an elevation. So it is terrain that is very, very similar to uh, Central Asia, if uh, for those of you who are familiar with that, uh, rolling steppies and then onto these really, really rugged mountains sitting up there uh, at uh, in the Himalayas, or in this region is actually the Trans Himalayas. So we are at a merely 11,500 feet uh, flat landscape. <laughs> no, I'm joking, but... Uh, yeah, we're really high up there. So our trip actually starts at, at a very high elevation, and which is why we also need to take the time to acclimatize ourselves to the surroundings. And this is the most, most important thing uh, to do on this trip. Uh, I mean, we, don't, we do not compromise on health and safety uh, in any way, and which is why we spend the mandatory two days of acclimatization in, in lay, uh, which we'll talk about uh, as we go along. Uh, the temperatures here can can vary quite a bit, uh, and not just during the day, but also seasonal as well. And your average temperature in in midwinter will drop to about five degrees Fahrenheit, and during the day sometimes it can go all the way up to forty. But usually we see those higher numbers uh, towards the end of of winter to the start of spring. But when this trip happens from December all the way to April, uh, you will see there is a contrasting uh, difference in the landscape uh, and because of the difference in the temperature that happens. So December and Jan are the coldest months in the dark and nighttime temperatures can dip to five degrees, sometimes even below, but five is kind of what we need to 
to expect uh, during our, our course there. And of course, as we progress into spring, it will go up a couple of notches. Now, where does this take place and what does our itinerary basically do? So there is the best part about this itinerary compared to some of our other trips that we do in the subcontinent. There is actually not a lot of travel. We arrive into Delhi for all practical purposes. It's, it's one of our largest uh, hubs, uh, transport hubs. So you'll have great connections to Delhi. We arrive there. We spend a day there. That's where we have our orientation. We meet uh, with each other and then we fly to Leh. Now, Leh is the capital of the region of Ladakh, uh, where I said we spend uh, two nights there. The first day is completely letting your body adjust. So we rest, we eat well, we hydrate a lot during this trip. It is so important. And then we spend the next day uh, doing short excursions to see how our body copes with the whole thing. And then the biggest chunk of time we spend out at our wilderness lodge at this place called Mangyu, which is only a couple of hours drive away from Lake. So we're not changing destinations every day, but we'll base ourselves uh, instead in one place and explore the region around that place, doing short trips out either by vehicle or by walk, uh, going really where the wildlife is. And uh, this entire, and another beauty about this entire itinerary is is that all of these excursions, all of these wildlife viewings, uh, all of them, which are fantastic viewings, by the way, all of them take place outside a national park or a protected area. And that's very, very unique uh, in India because if you look at wildlife watching in India, most of them are restricted to national parks. And because they're in national parks, uh, we have certain uh, protocols and procedures in place. Uh, and But apart from that, looking at wildlife out you know, sometimes in the pro close proximity of uh, villages, sometimes amongst habitation is truly a remarkable thing. And it's it truly asks those questions uh, as to how uh, or makes one ponder rather of uh, humans and wildlife living together. So it is an interesting landscape to, to run this trip. And we have some fantastic viewings. Uh, we've had a great uh, couple of seasons so far uh, with almost 100 percent success of seeing snow leopards in this region so it is it is uh, really the best place to go and the most accessible place to go and see snow leopards anywhere in the wild just now so we spent um, <clears throat> five days up at a, a lodge a wilderness lodge in mangyu post which we'll return back to Leh. we'll drive back to Leh, uh, spend the night there and then the next morning we fly back to delhi on practically the uh, you know mid-morning flight out reaching delhi by afternoon so, so a, a, a fairly short uh, trip compared, but a very, very action-packed and very, very intense trip. So let's take this day by day. Let's look at, at what our general schedule would look like and how we pace things uh, through this trip. All right. So we start uh, at this place called Gurgaon, I, uh, which is really a, a suburb of Delhi. Uh, we chose this place specifically because it is close to the airport and we have the most amazing uh, I think in my books, the most amazing airport hotel I've seen anywhere, uh, opulent and on such a grand scale, it just sort of raises the standard of what an airport hotel uh, should be like. And we've chosen specifically to be on the strip because it's a perfect place to come in. Um, it's, you know, the hospitality is great. The staff are wonderful and the food is amazing as well. And so a lovely, lovely start to the trip, you know, sort of come in whenever you come in for the international flights, you will be met, you'll be picked up from the airport, brought to the Trident Hotel in Gurgaon, where we will meet uh, on the first evening of the trip for our little orientation dinner, uh, introductions with the rest of the group and uh, the plan of action for the following days. So uh, once we reach the Gurgaon, uh, we're not going out anywhere. There is no sightseeing or any of that thing planned. Uh, because this is a singular focused itinerary where we head straight up into snow leopard country to see all the fantastic wildlife that is there. So your first foray into, if this is your first time coming to India, your first foray into the sort of cultural uh, vastness of this country uh, will be the next morning uh, at a very early hour at Delhi airport. Now, Delhi is, is infamous for a lot of things and uh, a crowded airport is one of them. Now, on this trip, uh, you know, domestic uh, flying domestic in India is, is very, very affordable. So it is also 
the best way uh, to commute when you have long distances. So therefore, there is a lot of traffic uh, in the airport and Delhi airport is one of the busiest airports in the world. So, uh, and because of the systems we have, uh, it tends to take a longer time to get through things uh, than anything else. Uh, and sometimes the queues can extend and can be very, very long. So therefore we leave off at two hours uh, before our scheduled departure time or flight departure time. Um, <clears throat> the lucky good thing for us is that we don't have a long commute. It's only about a 20 minute drive from our hotel to the airport. So we will meet quite early in the morning depending on our flight time we will meet uh, really before the clack of dawn but on 4 or 4 30 in the morning have a quick cup of coffee get ourselves charged up for the day uh, check our bags and head uh, head straight to the airport in our little van that will take us there now once we're at the airport of course your tour leader uh, will guide you through the queuing processes uh, and really you don't have to worry about any of the logic that go on because you have your tour leader with you throughout, your expedition leader throughout, and they will take care of this while you just sit and soak in all this vastness of humanity. And, and it's, it's, it's it's interesting people watching uh, as much as you know the wildlife that there is on this trip. So uh, at the airport, there are, there is a couple of things. Uh, please note that your checked luggage uh, we have a restriction of 55 pounds, and for your hand luggage, it's 15 pounds. Now, if you are a photographer, you're wondering, is that going to be enough? Now, the good part about uh, Indian systems is that they don't really weigh your hand luggage. So if it's one of those little camera bags that you have on your back, or if it's uh, a, a backpack that may sometimes weigh more than seven kilos, um, if, if you're carrying it and it doesn't look too bulky, they're not going to bother. But this is a good uh, checklist to, I mean, check, uh, to have. And even if it exceeds overweight, uh, I mean, the, the luggage allowance can be purchased at the counter and it's it's not that expensive in India yet. So uh, it's not bad, um, and, but just make sure you keep this in check uh, for a smooth uh, check-in process. Now, one thing that you will have to know, and we will specify this again uh, repeatedly sometimes on the trip as well, that once we're at security, it can be very, very, uh, disorienting for a lot of people because of the crowds in the first place and the long queues and you know a lot of hustle bustle going on uh, but one of the biggest things which I see a lot of people um, kind of getting very very uh, disoriented about is taking uh, is moving all the things out of your bag now we don't have scanners uh, of, of quality that which will x-ray your uh, electronics in the bag so therefore everything has to be manually scanned so you know camera bags will have to be opened up sometimes they will ask you to take your lenses out binoculars out all of that but you have those little trays uh, again your expedition leader with you will guide you through the entire process we put everything out of the bag we put everything back in uh, once we finished uh, with security so this is just uh, this just comes with a fair bit of warning that all airports in india uh, electronics have to come out of your bag now once you get get through this hustle and bustle out of the airport uh, it is actually a very short uh, and pleasant flight it's about an hour out of delhi and the moment you take off out of delhi in a few minutes you actually start flying over the himalayas and on a, on a clear day it's the most amazing view ever we see some of the highest peaks uh, over the western himalayas as we travel over and as you come into leh it's just that's when you get that first look of this magnificent you know vast landscape that sits at your feet or almost sitting at your feet as you land um, winter right from december all the way up to february we will have various degrees of snow sometimes there are uh, late snows in march and april as well but this this shot you see from you is a typical winter shot and as we move into march and april you'll see a lot more brown down uh, in the valley areas uh, with snow only being on the highest peaks. Now, once you arrive into Leh, it is a military air force base. So there are certain restrictions, but it is a small airport uh, with just two luggage belts. So uh, it's easy to find your luggage once you're in Leh. And once you're there, once we finished with the entry formalities, we will head out to our hotel in Grand Dragon. Now, like I said, Leh is also an important town uh, for the region. It's, it's a main trading town. So it is a busy town. We will have a short drive from the airport to the hotel, about 10 minutes long. 
and on which you'll see you know the markets and residential areas of lay as we drive through it has a huge army presence uh, the the entire region has a huge army presence being a border region and as you know uh, we're not sometimes on the most friendly terms with both our neighbors on either side so there is a huge military presence and that often can be unsettling for a lot of people so again this is something i'd like to tell people in advance uh, you're going to see army convoys you're going to see a lot of soldiers around but that doesn't mean there is unrest uh, it is just a general presence of the military that we have in the area anyway so once we reach the grand dragon hotel uh, this fantastic luxurious hotel that sits right in the middle of Blay, uh, beautiful comfortable place uh, with some of the best cappuccino and a really nice hearty breakfast is the first thing on the agenda uh, for that day so at grand dragon hotel usually we'll have uh, there, there will be a check-in process we'll head straight for breakfast because we do get there early morning and we've had an early start uh, once we've had breakfast we say we orient ourselves we kind of just get used to uh, to the weather the altitude by you know doing a little a uh, few things you know just walking around in the lobby or you know just a few steps here and there um, once we get used to that admire the views for a bit and then the entire day uh, is at your leisure now there is no activity planned for that day except for a few meetings with with the rest of the group and us as yearly uh, explaining uh, the course of action and what you will be doing now that day like i said is very important to stay hydrated to stay well fed uh, and well rested and that's going to help with the entire acclimatization process that we need for the rest of the trip on on day three is when we start our forays out into this uh, into this landscape we start off uh, a, a very integral part of the culture is the buddhist religion as well and you see it so ingrained uh, into uh, everyday life really so we will not miss an opportunity to go to maybe one or two monasteries on this trip and there's some fantastic monasteries along the drive that we take beautiful uh, first stop on top of hills on the banks of the river indus and uh, so that day uh, the plan is fairly flexible we have a point to which we will drive to uh, we'll gain elevation slightly ever so slightly a few hundred meters and then come back down to lay in the evening and during that day we will try to experience both the culture and the wildlife of the region so our excursions can extend to a monastery if there's an event or a special prayer for example that happens we will take that opportunity and, and go there uh, it is a great we will have a local guide with us who are so good at explaining uh, the entire uh, philosophy around buddhism and how it translates in everyday life uh, so it's a great time to to uh, to quiz them uh, to get an understanding into what local life really is and we will be driving through uh, residential areas we will be driving through villages and hamlets and when we have an opportunity to interact uh, we will use that opportunity as well um, now the best way to get around lay in my opinion uh, is uh, these little SUVs that we call innovas or cristas uh, and that's what we use for the entire trip they're small SUVs. They're not they're not four x four SUVs, but they can do a lot uh, in that landscape. And they uh, and we usually take two or three people to a, to a vehicle. And then on this trip, we usually have three or four vehicles that stick together. So we have our, our own little convoy uh, for this trip. Uh, these are great vehicles. They're super uh, agile and super super comfortable. So all those long drives along bumpy roads, uh, sometimes uh, these vehicles make it happen. So, uh, so we take the Toyotas out, we head out for that day uh, into another valley uh, across the Indus, looking just up soaking in the landscape and also looking at some of the wildlife that we have, um, such as blue sheep, uh, red sheep, uh, ibex, and so on. And there are some specials that we see only in this particular area that we go to that day, and uh, they include uh, Tibetan partridge. Um, they are found only uh, in a few spots around that area and uh, so we go out looking for them it's also a great place for a great day to see raptors uh, especially later on in the day as the thermals begin to rise you'll see raptors such as himalayan griffins bearded vultures golden eagles and so on and also it's a we always always keep our eyes open and ears open for any information that we may get on recent snow leopard sightings so it is a day to look out for wildlife and also soak in a bit of the landscape 
and culture as well. So at the end of day three, we come back uh, today. We will have lunch outside and come back uh, to our hotel in the evening, early evening, just to give us time to sort of have the nice shower, pack up and get ready for our next five days out at the lodge, which is in Mangyu. So Mangyu is chosen. We, uh, the lodge was chosen as a place because uh, it is it is a lovely village with about 60 odd houses in there, uh, but it also offers some great sightings at Snow Leopards. And this are tracks of a Snow Leopard just on one of the roads outside the lodge. Now uh, there is uh, it is the most uh, plushest accommodation in the region. And as we head into rural uh, lay or rural parts of India. Uh, facilities can be hard to come by, but uh, every care has been taken uh, to make sure that this lodge is up to not just comfortable, but actually up to uh, international standards. So we have heating at the lodge. Uh, there are proper beds. We have bathrooms as well. I'm going to show you pictures in a few minutes and uh, a strong, a strong uh, departure from how we used to do snow leopard tips before in the landscape, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago where everything was camping. And we had to dig in the hole in the ground, uh, you know, to ease yourself and use the facilities. That that was the facilities available. But now things have gotten better. And really, uh, what we want to what we want the message we want to put out there is that it is stark wilderness. It, it is a hard place to get to. Uh, but once you're there, you actually have this really really comfortable base of operations where you can uh, launch out of. So making your stay comfortably there. So this is a picture of the lodge, and this is the courtyard. Uh, as you can see, there is plenty of wildlife that we actually see around in this beautiful valley. And sometimes we've had great snow leopard sightings out at the lodge as well. So this is a picture from uh, February uh, getting into March. So you, you can see things turn fairly brown around, though there is a nip in the air and you will have to wear multiple layers. But um, during winter, and here's a video for you, uh, things can look quite different. This is after some first snow. Uh, last December. As you can see, the snow was so thick that we couldn't see uh, any of the hills even around us, so visibility was really, really poor. So it was, a, it was a good day and the video I'm not showing you here what what happened later was we all built snowmen. So um, and we had this beautiful cooking session with the staff inside. So on days like this when we don't go out, uh, there are backup plans and we, we do something else interesting while at the lodge. Uh, Monkey Lodge is, it sits at the top of the valley uh, and it faces east. So the most beautiful sunrise, uh, you'll see a moon rises in the night. Uh, beautiful rays of sun as it comes in up the valley and it really really is a special place you've got if you even stand out there on the on on the courtyard on the front area as we've shown you it's beautiful place to just observe people in the houses all around as they go about their daily uh, daily life so it's a lovely quaint village and we're there sitting right at the top of it uh, and all these hills around that we see all these mountains around that we see uh, about in wildlife but let's just talk about the lodge for a sec. So these are pictures from the inside. So we have really, really comfortable bedrooms, uh, the warmest jubes in Ladakh uh, to keep you nice and comfortable while you're there. And in, in addition to those wonderful duvets, uh, we also have hot water bottles that are given to you uh, in the night uh, to keep your feet warm. And there are also two kinds of heaters uh, in the room. Uh, in fact, I think the general complaint from our rooms that we've had, it's not that it's cold, but it's actually been too hot. So we do advise you to keep a window, crack a window open in the night uh, if you're using a wind, uh, wood fire or an electric heater. So the lodge is nice and comfortable and warm. And the picture you see here on uh, the left is the lounge and dining area. This is where we have most of our talks and discussions, uh, hang out in the evening, uh, discuss everything. Uh, India, including wildlife and its people, and the food and, and whatnot, uh, and also have our meals here at the lodge. Uh, so the bathrooms are on suite bathrooms. Every room has its attached bathroom, uh, and and we have facilities uh, there as well, such as 
a WC and a sink as well. The only thing that we do not have, um, which is not possible at this point, is running water. Uh, it's a heck of a lot of effort to get uh, running water in most places in Ladakh. It is actually a high altitude desert. So running water does come at a premium. But what we do have is an unlimited supply of what we call running water, uh, which is brought shuttled to you in buckets. So we will get warm water and cold water through the day. It's available and we have buckets. So one of the things that you need to prepare for this trip, but I think uh, something that we've all lost skill with is how to use a mug and a bucket before. So again, it's going to be like old house on the prairie uh, back again, but with, you know, good ceramics. Um, going to what we do on a daily basis or a typical day at the lodge. Uh, now, unlike all our other wildlife trips, we do not get up at the crack of dawn and we do not have to rush off anywhere in an open Jeep to see uh, wildlife. In fact, it's a little bit more civilized and a little bit more relaxed that way. Uh, our spotters, though, we work with a team of spotters uh, who go out in the morning and keep their eyes out on every single thing, scanning the, the landscape for any wildlife movement and the radio back to us the moment there is been a sighting. So if you, you can have a really good full night's sleep uh, a restful night, wake up in the morning to a beverage of your choice, a hot beverage of your choice, uh, come out, sit on the porch, soak things in, and then we always have our scopes and everything out there uh, so we can look around and scan for everything. So we usually start off the day uh, around the lodge for those more adventurous ones. We also have the option of taking a short walk if someone wants to go down to the village. Uh, there are so many trails. There's also a walk if you want to go to any of the hills around and just do uh, a bit of an exercise before you come back for that wonderful uh, breakfast that we have. So options are open for both of you depending on how you feel that day, how you're acclimatizing, and also what your uh, mobility uh, levels are. So be sure to speak to us, uh, be sure to speak to your adventure specialist and let us know what you would like to do. And uh, we would figure out something. So this, this trip has uh, the ability to be flexible and accommodate various degrees of uh, movement uh, in this program. And once we come back, usually the day starts with a lovely breakfast uh, that is served uh, at, at the lounge area. Uh, again, it's a beautiful room that lets in the sun, so it's a nice place to hang out in the morning, have your tea or coffee, uh, read a book, or just sit out uh, and come back in for breakfast. Now, a lot of our wildlife viewing in the area involves uh, scoping out the landscape. So whether you have your own scoping, uh, spotting scope, binoculars, uh, there is a lot of hard looking uh, that is involved. And um, people now in the area actually recognize our guests by the scopes they carry and sometimes join us in the action as well. But the scopes are such an important uh, part of this, uh, this trip and it makes for the wildlife viewing as well. Now, this is a vast landscape that we are in and uh, texturally very, very heavy with all those rugged peaks and stuff. So this take a day or two uh, to get your eye in, so to speak. Uh, but then thanks to our fantastic team of spotters that we have there, it is actually not hard work. But that's something which is really difficult to explain and something difficult to wrap your head around till it actually happens is getting used uh, to the whole scale of things there. So I would say as a prep, uh, if, if you're traveling out before, you know, try and develop your eye into looking at long distance things and finding them through the binoculars. If you're not someone who's not used binoculars or not used a scope before, I would say it's a good investment to have a pair of binoculars. And it does take a little time getting used to or getting your eyes used to holding. So as in terms of preparation, I would say that's something good to do. There is some hiking that's involved uh, in this. Sometimes we have to hike to places to see an animal. If there's a report of a snow leopard sitting up in a valley and our cars don't go get there, then we have to hike. Um, but in in the past uh, two and a half years that we've been running this, the third season now going going in, we've not really had to hike more than you know three hours on this. And that's and this is pictures from that uh, probably the longest hike I've ever done on any of my trips. Uh, up at at, uh, at the lodge, uh, but it was it was really worth it at the end. And again, we have enough staff, we have enough support uh, systems in place, 
so if you want to stagger this out and if you have different capacities we're able to <coughs> excuse me accommodate that as well now while you're looking at these images i want to uh, sidetrack a little bit and talk about gear now i'm going to be covering gear and what to pack and how to prepare for this trip uh, physically mentally emotionally so to speak in my next webinar that's coming up on the first but i just want to give you a little snapshot uh, on what to expect now we have to be prepared for everything from winds to snow uh, to sun as well so layering up is the key um, as you can see and, and it's especially if you're not walking and if you're sitting you actually need multiple layers because it can get windy especially in the afternoons uh, after two o'clock after three o'clock in the afternoon it does get a bit windy and when the sun drops behind the peaks the temperature also drops but as long as you're standing out there sometimes uh, during the day in the lovely sun you can just come down to one layer my most important part of kit um, i like in the whole thing is investing in some good warm underwear you now get uh, good merino wool or good uh, poly fleece um, stuff that is available and make sure that they're for sub-zero temperatures sub-zero celsius temperatures uh, and that is the most important in my opinion is so good woolen socks uh, we use double so I use double socks at least in, in my insulated boots and it's good to have a thin layer inside a thin pair of socks and then some nice woolies on top and I think the moment your core is warm your core temperature stays warm uh, you feel so comfortable that you're able to you know do other things during the rest of the day so core is the most important and that needs to stay warm so anything that keeps your core warm will keep you warm and comfortable uh, it does take a few days of getting used to, especially if one needs to pop behind a bush to, you know, use the, the uh, wilderness facilities, uh, you know, getting all, all those layers. But, well, we'll get there. Yeah, there's, uh, it's wonderful wildlife to be seen. And I think cold is just a minor uh, inconvenience uh, that one has to make to go and see this fantastic wildlife. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, exercises sometimes out when we're sitting. Uh, and there is going to be many hours involved where you know we've got our spotters scanning and they have some of the best vision in the country there's i mean in the world and there's no keeping up with the kind of vision that they have uh, and so while they are hard working at uh, you know using the scopes we can use our binoculars to look at birds we can stretch with it's a good time to to chat to catch up uh, talk to each other but we also do some exercises sometimes you know doing jumping jacks walking around just keeping your blood circulation moving also helps you keep uh warm but layers is is the key and i i don't even want to count the number of layers this lovely gentleman who kindly posed for for me by the way uh as a demonstration because i had to use this picture uh in the webinar and speaking of our spotters this trip really is done by a magnificent team of spotters they're out there from sun up to sundown scanning every nook cranny rock boulder bush uh in this massive landscape massively vast and open landscape uh for you know the slightest flicker of a, a snow leopard's ear or the tail move or and of course the other wildlife as well so there is a lot of hard work that that goes in they are especially gifted they have a uh, wonderful eyesight and if not for them this trip is not made uh so but and, and you get to know them over the course of time that you're spending with them, they're happy to chat and share information, talk about their families uh, and all of that. So it's a wonderful team of people, very warm uh, hearted people that we're there. And uh, yeah, so this is just to give you a picture of, of the kind of landscape uh, we're in. Uh, I, I actually took it from a hillock where I was standing with another spotter, but just to give you a size of scale, uh, this is only a fraction of, of what uh, this thing is about. And we, so it does take a little bit of getting used to and sometimes we see uh wildlife really far you know it could be walking a distant uh a ridge like this where you barely make out something and this is a picture through a scope uh where you watch the silhouette of something going there and um and and and, and a lot of our sightings actually happen like this so if if you're expecting you know an african style thing where you're sitting there in the wilderness surrounded by a few thousand wildebeest uh this is going to be a different tip Sometimes we spend days on end and do not have uh, a great sighting of a snow leopard. Uh, but again, 
that's the thing that you should that's the perspective you should go in it's a fantastic land to be in we are taking the best chances of seeing uh, and, and in the best landscape to see some one of the most elusive cats so we take all our chances we we make the best of our opportunities there but sometimes it can be difficult viewing um again this is just to give you a picture uh two seconds to spot the snow leopard in the picture all right for those of you who got it it's right there so like i was talking about being texturally heavy the landscape it can be difficult and of course this cat is adapted to camouflage itself uh in the background so it's good it's going to be hard to see them uh but sometimes you're rewarded with fantastic sightings such as this great eye level shot making eye contact with you not very far off taken with uh with a decent enough lens so in terms of of gear and what you should pack again this is something that um, i will cover again but uh, for our photographers out there if you're talking about what kind of lens uh, i i say this and i say this all the time it doesn't matter how big the lens is whenever you go to ladakh you're always going to feel inadequate uh, but um, any any camera that you have is the best camera uh, we also use the scope a lot we use digiscoping a lot as you see from this picture uh, we have some of the best people uh, and all of us now use this we have we fit up phones we can fit your phones on it as well uh, if you want you can invest in uh, in a digiscoping adapter they're more freely available in the states than they are uh, anywhere here in india and they're relatively cheap as well so if you want to get an adapter that fits onto your phone uh, try it out and then you know once you're out here on the trip we'll help you set it up and take videos and sometimes a, a, rather i would say a lot of people find it easier to look at the phone screen um, while we're recording uh, then you know sort of squinting sometimes through harsh light at the animal uh, itself so it does make for easier viewing it is definitely easier on the eyes um and we use all of these gadgets uh and the best guides to make uh our trip uh successful uh this is just a video of how this works this is a live video i'm shooting through my phone uh this is what a phone adapter does on a scope it fits right on the eyepiece uh it gives you a full screen uh and this is what you're looking at through the scope uh, minor adjustments here or there and you can get some reasonably good uh, pictures of uh, not reasonably good sorry i correct myself you can get some amazing pictures of animals some of our best uh, footage of the past few seasons has been on an iphone 14 pro mounted on an adapter through the scope uh, look at uh, our website and check out the webinars uh, that we've done previously on uh, the nathap channel and the instagram page you will see what I'm talking about. You do get some fantastic results uh, like this sometimes. Uh, it's it's really great as long as you have a very good. I mean, you have a phone with uh, with a decent enough resolution. We set it up there, and uh, it's fantastic. Most of the phones do very well at taking video as well, 4K or 8K video, and you get some fantastic images. So if you have a 200 lens and you're thinking, oh, is that going to be enough? Should I invest in in one? Well, it's a personal choice if you want to but i feel you're always going to have something that's going to be out of the length of the lens and uh, for that for everything else there's an iphone so we've got that and if you go and and we've got amazing pictures from little point and shoot cameras which have amazing uh, zooms as well some of these cameras go up to you know 1200 mm uh, zooms so any camera that you have will work uh, you might want to do a lot of adjustment with the lighting sometimes lighting can be harsh uh, i personally don't use filters uh, this was a question that was sent to us uh, i personally don't use filters but a good polarizer or a uv filter uh, can work and helps cut down some of that uh, glare and um, a lot of things can also be fixed in post processing uh, as well and once we're there even if it's a non photo trip uh, we're all happy to give you advice on how to get the best images uh depending on the type of day and what equipment you have so in terms of wildlife viewing and photography uh those are my uh inputs now the next uh session of this is where uh, on, on the first of november i'd like to talk to you about how to get ready for this trip 
uh, what can we really expect with wildlife? What kind of wildlife are we seeing? Is it just going to be snow leopards? Is there anything else? What are the other cool critters that live in this landscape? Uh, I will talk a little bit about that and also what should be go, what should go into your suitcase uh, and camera bag. Uh, so we'll cover that. So in case if you, you have more questions, uh, I'll be free to talk about it uh, at the next session as well. So send them in and we'll talk about this. Uh, this trip also gives you, uh, apart from the fantastic viewing and the lovely landscape, and I think the landscape is something that you know sort of prompts us to have these wonderful moments of reflection. And uh, like I said, it's 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 a fairly easy trip. <coughs> it does require some physical. I mean, it does have some physical requirements uh, because we are going to be at high altitudes. We are going to be at extreme uh, cold temperatures, and there is going to be some walking as well. But we also do get these moments where we're sitting down, relaxing having a cup of tea, talking to each other, getting to know other people in our group, uh, talking about the country, the landscape, the people, everything that's there, whilst looking out for, for animals at the same time. And uh, I, I, I love these moments because there's so much of sharing and reflection that happens uh, and deeper conversations as we uh, progress through the trip. Uh, and it's a wonderful time to get to know uh, each other as well. And we, there's these lovely moments where you can just sit out there, stare out into this vastness um, and enjoy uh, the sun or enjoy the moment uh, as it is. And one of the best parts of the day actually comes uh, when we're out in the field. My favorite part of the day is the lunch that we tend to have most often outside. So on a general day, if you were asking uh, and I showed you what a typical day at the lodge looks like, uh, if we were out on an excursion and we had to drive a couple of hours, We'd have lunch brought to us, a nice hot lunch served while we sit out uh, somewhere enjoying the view and enjoying this beautiful uh, landscape as it is. So, so again, to wrap things up, folks, for this one, it is a trip that's focused uh, primarily on enjoying uh, these animals in this fantastic landscape. Of course, all our focuses are out there. We dive to different spots, see uh, leopards. And when I say drive, it could be anywhere from a 10-minute drive to about a two-hour drive sometimes. and we spend days out there, we come back to our lodge uh, in the evenings or we come back for a meal. Every meal will be had back there, if not at a picnic site. Uh, and then we have this really, really comfortable base of operations uh, right in the middle of this wilderness where we can go out and see these amazing animals. So it's a wonderful trip uh, to, to come to. It's the most accessible place, like I said earlier, to see snow leopards. Uh, but again, if you're someone who has apprehensions about, oh, am I going to do this? I would say, yes, you can. It, it is, like I said, it does have its challenges. It does have some minimum physical requirements. So speak to your adventure specialist, send us your questions, ask us as you have. We've had, um, we've had people uh, across uh, age barriers, across demographics, everyone all over. People attend this program, uh, this trip, and have a great time here. And we have the support, we have the flexibility to accommodate uh, various uh, degrees of mobility and everything. So speak to your venture specialist, and they'll be able to tell you. So but again, my point was here to to tell all of you who, who tuned in today that it is a great trip. This is what we need to expect. Uh, sometimes we have some reality. Uh, you know, things things in reality differ from what we might see in the bro brochure, but it's a fantastic trip with great sightings and some great moments uh, to be had. So um, I just want to sign off here with uh, a jule, which means thank you. And uh, I'll hand it back over to you, Kendall. I know I, I crossed the time a little bit, but uh, hand it over to you to see if you have any questions from our audience. Oh, that was perfect. Thank, thank you. you, Conan. Uh, and I do have to say, I know a couple people, I'm very close to a couple of people who went on this trip with you, and they were blown away. These two have been everywhere, all over the world, and they loved this trip, so highly recommend it. Um, we do have some questions for you, and I just want to remind folks before we get to the Q&A that if you have a question, you can submit that in your control panel under the questions field. And if we don't get to your questions today, as Conan pointed out, um, your venture specialist or someone in the concierge department, uh, can certainly answer that question for you afterwards. All right. 
let's get into it. Um, one of the first questions that came in was uh, about someone who wanted to bring in um, a lens of theirs, um, a rather big lens, weighs about 12 pounds. And so they were just curious if they were able to pay for an extra carry on with this lens. Yes, yes. Again, this is something uh, we can do uh, at uh, the time of check-in at the flight as well, because as you know, all the all our delegate equipment does go on with us. Uh, but I would say if there's something really specific, uh, is let us know uh, through your adventure specialist, and they will let us know in our local office here in India. And there there are options to also pre-book something. So if we know um, specificities of things like you like now we know the weight, you know what kind of bag it is. Uh, we can actually pre-book uh, luggage allowances as well, uh, so we can then sh then shortens our time down at the check-in counter as well. But in case if we can't pre-book, that there's always an option to do. So answer is yes, it can be. And of course, if this is going to be for a photo pro uh, departure that we have, then we have uh, higher luggage allowances for that as well. But again, if if there's something like this that needs to be done, speak to your adventure specialist and we'll get it in the works. Yeah, it can be done. Need to bring that big lens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for this trip especially, yes. And yeah. another lens question uh, for someone who can't attend the next session live. Um, they're asking, will a 150 to 600 be sufficient? Yes, uh, and no. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I, no, I'm joking here. So, oh, so 150 to 600 is, is, uh, is a good lens. I used uh, a Tamron 16600 for for a few years, and I was very happy with the results. Uh, and the first time I took it up to Ladakh, I was like, I'm going to get these amazing snow leopard pictures. Uh, and then it's when the sort of the enormity of the landscape hit me, and I'm like, okay, I've got a five pixel image size. But having said that, having said that, not every single outing is the same. Uh, I've, I've now since switched to a smaller lens and I use a 400 lens instead and I've been getting amazing pictures from last season as well. So it really depends. Uh, if you have an option of an extender, bring that along as well. Uh, you will get some fantastic shots of wildlife. It's not that all our viewings are going to be super far away. We do have opportunities sometimes and you're even able to drive up to certain uh, areas and, and, and use the car and shoot from the car itself so it really depends we have the entire spectrum uh but yes and end, end of the day it's it's a good lens to have uh if if you have a chance of of uh borrowing a, a an extender or buying one uh go for it as well you will not regret it great and what about tripods should people bring their own yes i would say a, a good handy Lightweight tripod is a good investment anyway. If, if you have anything of the, the like, like the lenses we spoke about, it's good to have anyway. Uh, and because like on an everyday excursion, if you're worried about, is it going to be too cumbersome? Am I going to carry it around? Once we get past, uh, you know, sort of the airlines and all the check-in and all of that luggage, moving a tripod on a day-to-day -day basis around the lodge and around our excursions is no trouble at all. We, that's the reason why we sort of module uh, we, we work in a modular fashion with all the smaller vehicles, so there's plenty of boot space. Uh, you can throw it at the back of the car, and we'll have it brought up everywhere. So a good tripod uh, is best. Uh, unfortunately, all the tripods that we have up there are used for scopes, uh, so the most spare going tripods and any tripod uh, that we have there, we'll end up putting a scope on it. So yes, yeah, so please bring your tripod. Uh, even if it's a lightweight one, we'll often find support as well uh, to swap things and you know, make sure they're sturdy. Great. Um, so because of the scopes, do you think it's necessary for someone to bring their Sony RX10 camera or will just their iPhone suffice? Well, I'll tell you what about the RX10. I really like the camera. A um, good friend of mine, another uh, EL, uses it as well. And I've seen it in action. It's really great for all the other stuff. I mean, there's, there's so much of, of things going on in Ladakh. Uh, if, even if it's at the monastery and you want to get pictures of those wonderful paintings a little closer, uh, you know, yes, an iPhone is great. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, but having a camera, especially if you're someone who loves cameras like myself, uh, it's a great thing to have. You'll always find that thing like, hmm, okay, this is going to look better with an 80mm or this is going to look better at 100mm. 
And uh, yes, you're not going to get the super long telephoto shots with an RX 100, uh, but it's great for all those mid-level and beautiful landscapes that you can compose with it. So, and it's it's small enough to carry. So I would say, yeah, please, please do bring the RX 100. Yeah. Great. Uh, so a couple questions about scopes and binoculars. Um, so I'll kind of combine them uh, into one. Um, someone's wondering if uh, binoculars really add value if you're going to have scopes there anyway. Should we? Should they bring them? And someone else is wondering if it's worth bringing a personal scope. Yes. Um, yes to all of them. Uh, I have been using binoculars uh, since the day I, I got into it. Uh, this this uh, this field. Uh, it was sold to me by my friend. Uh, I mean, the idea was sold to me and the binoculars as well. Uh, and I haven't regretted it since. I, I never leave, I literally don't leave home without my binoculars because it's such an important tool to have. Uh, and again, if, if you were asking, yeah, but it's, things are going to be super far away, um, it doesn't always make sense. But there are many times that it actually does make sense. Uh, and it's a wonderful uh, thing to have. And you just see things a lot more clearly closer birds for instance uh, you know often we see these little brown jobbies flying overhead but when we look look at them through binoculars we start to observe all those little features and i think that's that's our connection it's a better connection you make with the wildlife they are trying to see but you see that detail so i highly recommend binoculars and on on that note uh, even if it's a small 7 by 35 one of those compact ones to keep in your pocket it's it's good uh, it's portable it's nice an 8x42 is the most comfortable I, I uh, like, I use. People use 10x50s as well. I've used a 10x50 for a while, uh, which gives you more magnification uh, and a bigger, uh, uh, but more narrower field of view. And they can be great, of course, for the super long distance ones. Uh, but if you have a normal 8x42, it's, it's a great thing to have. So, so you can uh, bring a binocular. And if you have your scope, yes. Uh, please bring your scope as well. Uh, you will need a tripod for that too. Now, what we do um, is because we also don't do large groups. We have a small enough group. Yes, we all take turns at scopes. Uh, sometimes we carry our personal scopes as well. Uh, but an extra scope is is never a bad thing if you have the space for it in your luggage and you don't mind lugging it around. This is the place where you would carry a scope too. So. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, take that call. Uh, if you have space in your luggage, uh, please bring us go. I recommend it, yeah. Great. Uh, there were some questions about the hiking. It sounds like people are wondering how strenuous the hikes are, how long they can be, if they should bring hiking poles. What's the farthest that you've ever had to walk on a snow leopard's trip? Well, the farthest I have ever had to walk on from that image I, I showed earlier, I think, uh, this, this was our very first trip of the season, the very first trip of the very first season. And we got news of the snow leopard that was in the valley, a mother with two cubs, and she was uh, feeding on an ibex. And uh, we heard that it was, according to local uh, distance, it was about an hour away. Uh, but non-local distance, it was about three hours. Uh, but it was a gradual incline up the valley, and everybody made it. Uh, everyone made it, and uh, the determination to see on on uh, some of our most senior guests was just amazing. Uh, it, it was fantastic, uh, but that's really was the longest. And most often our hikes don't are not that long. Um, and again, we have the flexibility of doing shorter hikes. Sometimes we just take a hike for the sake of of walking because we haven't stretched our legs in a bit, uh, and there's been a lot of standing and sitting uh, and eating. So uh, and again, that that will be decided on the day. We'll take a vote, we'll see who wants to walk. But again, this trip has a flexibility. Uh, if you don't want to do any hiking at all, if you're just okay from you know walking from your vehicle to the spot or you know back from your vehicle to the lodge, and, and that's enough. If you are that person and that's enough walking for you, perfect. This is the trip for you. If you're a person who says, Oh no, I have to put in a couple of miles hike uh, before I do breakfast in the morning, this is the trip for you. We have the capacity, we have the flexibility to accommodate uh both ends and everything in between uh, of the spectrum. Uh, and, and this is something that we can talk on a daily basis. Uh, you can go out with the spotters in the morning. You can take a walk with one of our staff there or with your EL uh, and, and we can accommodate all across that. Yeah. But um, <coughs> there is no 
fixed plan as such for hiking. Um, there are stairs though, and I will say some of these monasteries are on inclines and there are places in the monasteries if we have to, we have to take the stairs. Uh, but then again, that's a choice. If, if, you, if you don't do very well with stairs and you want to sit out and, uh, or skip a particular portion of it, then that's an option as well. Okay, great. Yeah, I, am, I invite anyone watching who may be hesitant or have further questions about the hikes to speak their, to their adventure specialist about um, what exactly we feel is required for this trip. Um, okay, just a couple more yeah. questions. We're getting close to the top of the hour here, so I'm going to call it after just a couple more. Um, so there's a few people wondering about the likelihood of having some snow days where you can't really get out. Um, because the snow is deeper, or is, is that likely? Um, can you go out and explore the surrounding area if that's the case? Or if it is snowing and they're leopard sighted, um, will you be able to get to them with vehicles? Yeah, so there is a possibility. And I'll tell you one thing about this trip is uh, what it will test is your resilience. Uh, we have to be super flexible because we're completely at uh you know the call of of uh, nature and how dynamics unfold and and i suppose is uh, with most wildlife trips and so we you know we take every opportunity we get and so sometimes we wear opportunities and say well this is not really a great chance and we should do this instead uh, so this so we're constantly switching plans but we do have plans uh, we may be constantly altering them to offer us the best chances now with that in mind um there are days where we do get snowed out i think in the whole of my last season there were just two days uh, in all those trips that we ran that uh, we had two snow days and but they were wonderful days uh, we did go out one one of them was a video we showed you and that was sort of midway during the trip and we had had some wonderful sightings of wildlife including the snow leopard before that so it was a nice day to kind of just you know it was an easy morning to relax and by the afternoon things cleared and we were able to go out uh, and walk around a bit but it was nice day to just you know sort of play around and just relax and we we have backup plans as well the village is nice enough to explore we've gone to uh, local houses uh, we've had tea we've gone to a 10th century temple that's right behind uh, our lodge with some of the first natural dye paintings of buddhist uh, iconography in the world uh, so there's all these little hidden gems that can have. We've had a wonderful cooking session with our staff before where we, we taught guests how to make naans and how to make momos and, and all the wonderful cuisine that we've been eating all those days. So there's always backup plans, there are things. Because what happens when it snows is the visibility drops. Um, so we really can't, we don't see anything at all. But the moment there is some visibility, uh, we're able to go out. And we have, the vehicles are equipped with snow chains. Uh, we can take a call um, if it's absolutely necessary. And if it's not compromising our safety, uh, we can take a call and drive out. Uh, but usually we don't get snowed in and the roads usually are not blocked. Again, this is thanks to the army and a, a lot of civil movement that happens. So we never get snowed in a destination where we say we can't reach the airport on time or any of that. Uh, so uh, yeah, the only, the only drawback to that is the visibility drops. Uh, and we need to take a call based on that. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to yeah. do one more question just because a few people sure. asked about this before I call it. The, so a few people are wondering when the spotters go out early in the morning, is it possible mm -hmm. to join them? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we have, uh, so we all go out to different directions. We have four, four spotters working with us at the lodge. Uh, so they all sort of go out in four different directions. Sometimes we team up depending on what happens in, uh, in the day. Uh, but the best part about uh, where the lodge is and, and the environment around it is there are so many trails. So um, usually the spotters, when they go out in the morning, they are at, they are going at spotter speed uh, or we drop them off somewhere. Uh, so in case uh, you can't keep up as well, we can still tag along and, and tag behind. And there's lots of trails, uh, very visible trails and nowhere where you can get lost. But there's many of these trails which you can take out, go back. It's one way in, one way out. And you'll always see the lodge from wherever you are in the valley and you sort of come back towards that direction as well. So, yeah, it's it's um, there's lots of opportunities to walk around uh, early morning there as well. Great. That's awesome. There's so much flexibility on this trip. It sounds great. Yes. Um, 
All right, I am going to call it there, and I uh, do want to invite everyone to join us next week for part two. And Conan, I have you down for Monday. I know I switched that date on you a couple of times, so we got you down for Monday. Uh, and actually, we're doing a binoculars presentation with Aditya on Tuesday. So I know we talked a lot about that today. So if you're interested in learning more about binoculars, that's a great, great one to join. Um, all right, Conan, I'm going to hand it back over to you for closing comments. All right. Thanks, Kendall. And uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you for joining. I love to hear those questions. Uh, it's nice to have this little conversation about uh, about these tips. Uh, and I think it's a great way now that, you know, you sort of give you a little insight uh, and a little dialogue into what actually happens and, and stuff you can't see in, in the brochure. Uh, but it is a fantastic trip. Ladakh awaits you. The snow leopards await. Uh, it's, it's a great place to be. Uh, it's a fantastic trip to sign up for. Uh, and I do look forward to seeing uh, all of you here uh, for this wonderful trip. So thank you once again for, for joining me and listening to me and uh, send in your questions and I'll be talking to you again on Monday. So have a lovely weekend, folks. Thank you so much again, Conan. And my thanks as well to everyone who tuned in today. If we didn't get to your question, join us on Monday for part two or give us a call and speak to your adventure specialist or someone in concierge who can answer all of your questions regarding this trip. Um, next week, uh, we've got a whole new lineup and we'll have that on our website later this afternoon. And of course, look out for our Sunday e-news announcement. We did record today's presentation and we'll have the replay available on our website soon. And with that, I'll conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great weekend. Good night, Conan. Good night. Bye-bye, everyone.